Hello, honors physics students. Let's go ahead and take a look at problem 24. So here we have our obsolete charge parallel plates. And even though the problem doesn't tell you to, it's just a good habit to go ahead and start drawing the electric field lines. So just pause the video, draw the electric field lines between those plates, come back and see how I did it. Okay, so remember the really important thing about obsolete charge parallel plates is that they will create a uniform electric field. We know that field lines start on a positive and on a negative, and it has nothing to do with what sort of object is they were experiencing in the field. So it doesn't matter if there's an electron or proton, positive charge, negative charge, doesn't matter at all. We know the field lines will point this way to the right from positive to negative. They should be evenly spaced, they should be perfectly straight, and all we care about is the field really between the plates. Don't worry about any sort of edge effects that we showed before. It sort of bows out to the side. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about the field over here, field over there. All we care about is this uniform electric field between the plates. All right, let's start answering some questions here. So we just finished talking about electric potential energy, and we know that that is measured relative to where the object wants to be. And so where's D equal to zero in this problem? Where does the electron want to be? It wants to be at the positive plate, so that means that D equals zero at the positive plate. That's where it would have no potential energy, or the lowest potential energy in the system. It's like an object resting on the ground. That's exactly where it wants to be. All right, how about letter B? How much electric potential energy does the electron have when it's at the negative plate? Pause the video, try it on your own. Okay, real simple here, you know, obviously we're doing PE equals QED. This problem is tailor-made for this equation. Put the numbers in, remember we are taking absolute value. Right? And should have 2.40 times 10 negative 18th joules, just a simple matter of putting everything in. I'm sure that you notice, of course, that the distance there is given in centimeters and you convert it, otherwise your power 10 is going to be wrong. You always look for those things. What about potential energy at the positive place? Well, we just established D equals zero at the positive place. Of course, it has no potential energy, which I just talked about, right? It's exactly where it wants to be when it's up against the positive place, like an object on the ground. All right, want to find change of potential energy? Go ahead and do that. We know any change will always be final minus initial. Just have to read carefully so we know which is the final, which is the initial. It has nothing to do with the picture. It has to do with what's stated here in the problem. It says it moves from the negative to the positive, right? This is the electric potential energy at the negative, so that's got to be the initial. This is at the positive. That's going to be the final according to what the problem says. It's not a guessing game. You have to actually follow what it says. And so in this case, it would be negative 2.40 times 10 negative 18 joules. Well, let's just look at this for a second and make sure we understand why is it negative? What does it mean to be a loss of potential energy? And I know it's kind of abstracting about charges, so again we go to our usual situation, gravitation, right? It's losing potential energy, it's going where it wants to go. So let's look at an object of mass m above the ground, right? You want to use that same phrase, going where it wants to go, right? If it let, were to let this go, where would it want to go? It would want to go down, of course it would, right? All right, so let's talk about this in terms of potential energy. Remember, an object has or system has potential energy when the objects are in a position or location where they don't want to be. So when it's up here, it doesn't really want to be there. It's got the system has a lot of potential energy. Down here, it has less potential energy, and so the change is negative, right? It's losing potential energy, going where it wants to go. And so in this case, this po negative charge is being moved from the negative to the positive. It's going where it wants to go. It's losing potential energy. Everything makes sense. How about letter E? Where's electric potential energy go? I mean, I'm not giving anything away here. Of course, it's going to go into kinetic energy. We just established the idea that we can be using conservation of energy. Right? You let it go. It goes where it wants to go. It's losing potential energy, gaining kinetic energy. All right. So for letter F here, release it from rest from the positive, oh, negative plate. It's going to go over to the positive plate. Okay. Uh, I want to find out how fast it's moving. I want you to put a line down the middle because we're really going to look at this in two different ways. So I want you to pause the video and I want you to use one side or the other. Obviously, you know, one side. And go ahead and solve the best as you can, and then we're going to go through how we can tackle from two different uh, methods of uh, uh, two different methods of equations. Okay, now one way of going about this is with energy, and the other way about going, going about this is with forces. Let's look at each to make sure we know are we allowed to use them and when we're allowed to use them. So we know to use conservation of energy, we can only have conservative forces acting. So we have this electron, it's up against the negative plate, we let it go. What force is acting on it? Well, the electrostatic force, right? Electrostatic force is pulling it away against the uh, electric field lines towards the positive plate because it's a negative charge attracted that way. And we just established in the previous video that the electrostatic force is a conservative force. Is there a gravitational force acting on it? Yeah, I guess there is, but remember the gravitational force is completely dwarfed by electrostatic force. You don't have to worry about it. It's effects whatsoever. Problems doesn't explicitly say so, but you don't have to. Okay, so conservation energy is certainly a valid way to go. What about forces in kinematics, right? If you had done this with sigma F equals ma, and then you want to find the speed, the quickest way to do that, uh, pun intended, would be to use the time-independent kinematics equation. And of course, you know, finding time and using one of the other equations is fine as well, but let's just make sure this is valid. We know there are certain restrictions on kinematics. Mm. 
What are those restrictions? Well, we know we're only allowed to skin max when the acceleration is uniform, when there's a constant acceleration. So the question is, is there a constant acceleration in this situation, with this electron going from the negative plates to the positive plates? Well, here's the equation that would tell us this. To have a constant acceleration, obviously it has to be a constant mass, and this electrons, the mass doesn't change, but it also means it has to be a constant net force. Is there a constant net force? Well, what force is acting on the electron as it moves against the field lines? It's the electrostatic force given by Q times E. So is that constant? Well, the charge is constant. What about the field? Ah, it's the oppositely charged parallel plates. This is the prime example of a constant electric field. In fact, it's the only example of a constant electric field. So with, uni with a uniform field, with oppositely charged parallel plates, you are absolutely allowed to say the acceleration is uniform. You are absolutely allowed to use kinematics. So I want you to go through the energy solution, and then also I want you to go through the forces and kinematics solution. To prove to yourself you should be able to get the same answer either way. Come back to the video when you've done one or both so you can see how I do. All right, so from an energy standpoint, we know it's released from rest. The initial kinetic energy is zero. It's going where it wants to go, and so the final potential energy is zero as well, as we established over here. So really, it's just a transformation of electric potential energy, which is the initial, that's what we had here when it's up against the negative plates, into final kinetic energy, which are replaced here with one half mvf squared. Of course, we do our rearrangement, so vf equals the square root of two initial potential energy divided by the mass. Now, the mass is not given in this problem. How do we know the mass? Oh, wait, we're told it's an electron. Remember, every electron has the exact same mass as every other electron, so you look it up. You don't have to memorize the mass of an electron. Maybe after doing a bunch of these problems, you happen to memorize the mass of an electron, which is fine. But if you didn't, well, look it up somewhere. Okay. What about from this perspective? Well, we know the initial speed is zero, so we can solve this for the final speed squared. We just established that the net force is given by the electrostatic force. So that's going to be the acceleration is sigma f over m. So I place a here with f e over m. The electrostatic force is given by q times e. I just took the square root of both sides. Remember, this, we're not allowed to use Coulomb's law here because while we certainly have a point charge, the plates themselves are not point charges. So kq q over r squared is invalid in this case because these are not point charges. So it doesn't matter. We have the field strength. We have the charge of the electron. And so we have q e delta, 2 q e delta x over m. Which is interesting because QE delta X, well, isn't that just a change in electric potential energy? QED, QE delta X. So, of course, we're going to get the exact same results because these two equations are completely equivalent. Electric potential energy is QED or QE delta X. No matter how you go about doing it, we should be getting 2.30 times 10 to the sixth meters per second. A common mistake here is perhaps putting the charge instead of the mass in here because I know the numbers are very similar. We have to get used to that. Also, maybe forgetting to take the square root, right? If you had gotten a number on the order of 10 to the 12th meters per second, immediately a big red flag should go up. You should say, wait a second, 10 to the 12th meters per second, that's impossible. Nothing can go faster than 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, right? We know the speed, the ultimate speed limit of the universe is the speed of light in a vacuum. And so if you ever get a speed larger than 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, you made a real big error somewhere. Maybe it's a unit conversion. Maybe it is just forgetting to take the square root. Real simple things to check for. All right, go ahead and do letter G on your own. Okay, so here we're just doing straight up kinematics, so you can do any of your favorite kinematics equations, except, of course, the time-independent kinematics equation, because, you know, um, it doesn't have time in it, so don't do that. Okay, so you could do delta x equals v naught c plus half at squared, the speed is zero, so you rear into time, we get our, our usual square root of two delta x over a, that looks real familiar, you should have recognized that, in fact, if you had gone to this immediately, that would have been fine too. Alternatively, you can take the acceleration equation, rearrange when the initial speed is zero. We just got the final speed. You would have had either of these able to find the acceleration by doing sigma f over a, or f e over, over m, excuse me, sigma f over m, or f e over m. So, I don't know, maybe you've done that as a separate step over here instead of combining all into one equation. So, if you have that, of course, you could always do delta x equals v bar t, rearrange it for time, time equals delta x over v bar. But if you aren't putting v bar, what speed are you putting in there, right? It's not the final speed. And at this point in the year, honestly, if it's April, and you're still doing this equation without V-bar, I don't know what you're doing. And you don't either, unfortunately, right? Honors physics students, you should absolutely know it's V-bar every single time. So you just have to find V-bar, which is real simple, right? It's just the average speed between zero, because it's start from rest, and this final speed. But if you don't put that in, you're going to get it wrong, always, right? No matter how you do it, you should be getting 1.74 times 10 negative 7 seconds. And if you had used any of the equations with acceleration along the way, you had to calculate that. So just as a, a checkpoint, if you'd gotten this as the acceleration, you know things are going well, although this equation here doesn't require the acceleration at all. 